Governor uh, Kate Brown, Democratic Governor of Oregon, uh, it's great to be with you uh, uh, this morning, our time, this afternoon uh, in Europe, where many of the people will be watching this. Uh, uh, it's uh, terrific to have a conversation with you because uh, um, uh, all governors, I think, in, in this uh, era of a pandemic face uh, special challenges, unexpected challenges, ones they weren't facing, uh, uh, weren't expecting to face when they came in uh, with the uh, uh, with, with whatever their agendas are, that, that agenda has been, if not hijacked, certainly added to. I think you've got special challenges, as we all know, uh, with the turmoil in Portland. And, uh, uh, of course, you were even mentioned in the presidential debate, uh, if that's the right noun for what happened the other night. Um, um, uh, I can think of other nouns that would work. So anyway, to have a conversation with you about what's going on in Oregon, how you see the national picture, what your leadership challenges are as a governor, I think is a great opportunity uh, uh, for us. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about Oregon, uh, just for starters. Uh, uh, I have uh, great associations with the state. Uh, I think almost anybody who visits uh, leaves with great uh, associations, wonderful city of Portland, a great coast, great mountains. I associate Oregon with uh, lattes, with bike trails, with uh, a fantastic uh, uh, coast. And so it's uh, odd for me. I don't fully understand uh, uh, when I read the news and, and we see uh, Oregon associated with uh, with violence, uh, with uh, people on the uh, uh, agitated people on the far right, a number of people very agitated on the left um, and uh, uh, mayhem. Uh, I don't understand it. Could you explain to me what has happened? How did Oregon get like this? And these movements on the left and the right, uh, where do they come from? The, presumably they don't come in isolation. They're not simply a Trump phenomenon. The, uh, there's something more than that. Well, thank you for talking about the beauty and, and bounty of Oregon. We're extremely proud of our uh, 362 miles of coastline that are publicly accessible. Obviously, mountains, deserts, forests. Uh, we are certainly on the vanguard and have been for a number of decades uh, on pr issues of progressive public policy. Oregon was the first state in the entire country um, to pass a land use planning bill. Uh, we also were the first state uh, to create the bottle bill, the deposit, uh, when you bring your bottle back or your can back. And more recently, we were uh, at the forefront uh, of elections issues with the passage of our vote by mail in the late 90s and our more recent policy to expand automatic voter registration to ensure that every eligible Oregonian has the opportunity to participate in this very fundamental right. But certainly uh, what is happening here on the ground, and I will say uh, we have... Um, frankly, limited uh, the number of folks that are engaged in these clashes. It's roughly about 150 folks every single night, both on the right and the left. And I think it's really um, a, a illustration or an underpinning of what's happening in our country right now. Um, it is a quest, at least on the ground right here, right now, uh, to eradicate racism in our institutions, in our cultures, and frankly, in our systems. And it is absolutely long overdue. Uh, and I I'm honestly proud of the work we have done uh, to begin tackling these issues. Uh, the legislature has passed over six bills to address police brutality and ensure that our law enforcement uh, troops are being held accountable. Uh, I have taken the steps to create a racial justice council uh, to begin to center the voices of black and brown and indigenous people in my uh, creation of a budget uh, for the next biennium and for my legislative agenda. Obviously a lot more work to be done um, but clearly what's happening on the ground here um, is really, uh, I think, uh, an indicator of the challenges that we are facing across the entire country. You mentioned that um, uh, the people actually out on the streets or, or, or uh, at the forefront of unrest, really only 150 people or so at both sides. I mean, what's your takeaway from that or what should our takeaway be? Uh, obviously, the issues that they're uh, that the uh, people are talking about and identifying are real, but is, is some of the, um, do, does the unrest get magnified by the media or, or the way it, uh, 
plays out and echoes in the political debate? Uh, 150 doesn't sound like very many to me. Um, if you listen to Trump's Twitter or if you read Trump's Twitter feed, it, it sounds like the entire city of Portland is burning. Um, mm -hmm. That is clearly not the case. Yes. Are there protests every night? Yes. No question about it. Uh, is there a level of violence happening in, during those protests? Yes. Uh, there's rock throwing. Uh, there's uh, fire started in trash cans. Uh, there's certainly uh, property destru destruction and certainly uh, some physical uh, injuries happening. Uh, but it certainly is not widespread throughout the entire city. And we're literally talking about 150 to 200 people. Over the weekend, we did have the Proud Boys come uh, to Oregon. Uh, this happens every summer. I'm honestly uh, very pleased with how our law enforcement handled the situation. We were expecting over 10,000 people. I declared a state of emergency and created a unified command. So we had both our state uh, troopers, our local sheriff's department, and our Portland Police Bureau all working together collaboratively uh, to address the concerns. They literally had a couple hundred people show up. Uh, there were a couple dozen arrests. Um, I speak for many Oregonians when I say that white supremacy, these hate nationalists are not tolerated in this state. And frankly, they should not be tolerated in this country. Unfortunately, our president obviously disagrees. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say to people watching to, in, in the spirit of conversation, just uh, uh, send messages or comments as you have them. Uh, so we can get a conversation going. As a moderator, I never like to just hold questions to the end. I like to, to weave them uh, uh, in uh, throughout. And we do have one uh, observation of somebody that uh, we want to talk, they want to hear about Oregon broadly, not just Portland. I think that's a good point um, uh, uh, that uh, Paul Sinar, uh, who's I think listening in New York, uh, says that uh, Oregon's a lot more than just the, uh, uh, just Portland. Um, Tell me what you have learned in the, 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 these recent weeks of unrest uh, that would apply in other places to other governors if they find this situation. Uh, and incidentally, is what's happening in Portland, could that happen in any uh, city? Um, are, are the condition or are there unique conditions about Portland that's made this happen? Um, sh should any governor of any state be thinking, you know, under the right set of circumstances, I could have the same the same problem that the Oregon governor does. Well, I, I think there's absolutely no question that this is happening in cities around the entire country. And it's a wake up call for all of us um, that we all need to recommit ourselves to tackling uh, the issues of racism in our education system, in our healthcare system, in our criminal justice system. And I count myself amongst the many frankly, white politicians in this country um, who haven't done enough to tackle these issues. And so, yes, I know that my governors across the entire country are working on these issues um, based on, you know, the states and the communities that they're in. But we've had multiple layers of challenges here in my state. In addition to the pandemic and the issues of social unrest, uh, we've just seen uh, in the last couple of weeks historically devastating wildfires, mm -hmm. um, particularly impacting our rural communities. Um, we had a historic wind event over the Labor Day weekend uh, that caused um, uh, so many fires. Uh, I think we still haven't counted them all. And it devastated um, very small communities in the mid Willamette Valley uh, and in Southern Oregon, literally the towns of Phoenix and talent have been wiped out entirely. Um, and I, I think for me, the lessons from all of this is that it is absolutely so key um, that we put aside our political differences, um, not only in Oregon, but across the country and work together um, to build a better Oregon, a better country, a more resilient country, a country that is more just and equitable for everyone. And I think one of the lessons for me that I, I look forward to sharing with my fellow governors is that 
conversation and dialogue are truly the most uh, productive way of problem solving. And I'll go to the situation where we had literally Trump's troops on the streets of Portland uh, after uh, there were some issues around a federal courthouse. Uh, the president sent in uh, Department of Homeland Security officers, ICE, Border Patrol, and others. And the protests grew from a couple hundred um, to thousands of Oregonians who were outraged um, at the behavior. We literally had uh, federal officers in picking up uh, Oregonians and putting them into unmarked vans. Mm -hmm. What I did following. Actually, if I, because you're very much on point to a question that comes from a professor of philosophy, I assume in Germany, who's watching this, Hans Kirchler. And uh, he says, why is it difficult to, conven uh, to uh, prevent and contain this violence? So why is there not constructive engagement uh, with the federal government on this? And, and I thought I, you were on the theme of what he was asking. I, um, I thought I'd pose his question uh, directly. Why is it, uh, it seems like you're, the federal government, from what you're saying, is, uh, is exacerbating the situation rather than oh. helping contain it. In terms of the, the, uh, protests in Portland, there's absolutely no question that the federal government is exacerbating the situation. And our president in particular is doing it intentionally on multiple levels. I just mentioned um, sending in federal troops. Uh, I called them Trump's troops because that's literally what they were. Uh, instead of 150 protesters, we all of a sudden had 1,500 and 5,000. Oregonians were outraged. Uh, that our federal government uh, was uh, engaging in this type of behavior. But I will also say there's a lot of frustration. With President Trump directly during any of this? I did not uh, speak with President Trump. I was just going to say, however, I did reach out to a couple of key folks in the administration, uh, the vice president, Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, I would put him in uh, a category I call connector, if he can't help you solve a problem, he gets you to the right people. Uh, he connected me to the president's chief of staff and through productive conversations and conversations with folks on the ground, we were able to resolve the situation. We came up with an agreement that our Oregon state police officers would uh, protect the federal courthouse for a period of a couple weeks and that uh, calmed things down substantially. But let me share another circumstance where I think the federal government failed in, leader, in its leadership, and that's throughout the pandemic. Um, you mentioned governors. We have truly been on the front lines of this pandemic, struggling about how to get adequate uh, personal protective equipment, how to get testing capacity ramped up. Um, in countries where they have been successful tackling uh, the coronavirus, this pandemic, they have a national response. I think by any measure, you can say that the United States of America had no federal response to this pandemic. And I would argue that Trump sending troops to Portland was a distraction from his failure to lead this country uh, through this pandemic. And we are seeing it today uh, in terms of our death toll. We're now at 200,000 uh, in terms of the number of people who've been impacted by this pandemic and in terms of the challenges uh, that our communities are facing. Yeah. So um, the irony of all of this, um, the protests, the social unrest um, and uh, the pandemic is that we truly have needed federal assistance. Yeah. And where we really needed it throughout the pandemic, we didn't have it. And if we'd had a really, um, uh, what you would see as a really enlightened uh, policy uh, from the federal government, what tangible help would you have gotten? That's a really good question. We know early on that countries that um, substantially ramped up testing efforts, uh, they saw uh, the ability to identify cases early and quarantine, isolate folks. Um, we know that countries that 
um, provided support, both financial and wraparound services to families when they were impacted by the virus, that they were able to contain it easily and quickly. And particularly in countries um, in Southeast Asia where they began wearing face coverings, um, they didn't, and obviously it is more common in those cultures than it is in the United States, they didn't have the significant case counts that we have seen in the United States of America, where contrary to science, our president has been spreading misinformation throughout this entire pandemic. And I think I read, there's a, there's a word for it, it's called infodemic. Uh, but he is responsible for the majority of misinformation regarding the pandemic in this country. You know, we've got a question. I, I think it's from um, uh, Indonesia because the person uh, mentions having two Indonesian friends uh, in Portland. And uh, 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 they uh, ask a question about just how fragile do you see the social fabric in the United States in the way mm -hmm. of this election? And, and I must have just to add to that, listening to you, uh, uh, um, one does get a sense of the, the country just uh, uh, really uh, dancing kind of recklessly on, on the edge of catastrophe with, uh, 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 with uh, racial and political unrest. You mentioned these uh, uh, horrific wildfires that, uh, have, uh, that are all over the West, and including in Oregon. And all of a sudden, the, it, we just see this country, which we think of as being very stable, uh, uh, feels awfully, awfully fragile. Um, uh, how fragile and how combustible are we? And uh, uh, particularly in the uh, context of an election result that may not be known with finality on the late in the night of uh, November 3rd. Look, um, there's absolutely no question um, that the social fabric of our country is frayed right now. And that's why for me, I think it's incredibly important that the foundation of our democracy remains strong. And that's why I'm working with a number of my governors. Um, I know that um, secretaries of state, including the secretary of state here in Oregon, who oversees elections, are working really, really hard to make sure that every eligible Oregonian and with my fellow governors, every eligible American has the opportunity to vote, whether it's, um, at home via the mail or going to a polling place and that that vote is actually counted. And uh, I, I think it is extremely damaging to our country that the president is using a government uh, to undermine uh, democracy, to suppress the vote, and frankly, so the seeds of doubt in his supporters about the outcome of the election. Governor, in Oregon, you don't no longer can vote in person, right? You're 100% by mail? We, we are considered 100% vote by mail, vote at home. We're the first state in the country to do that. But you can also vote in person. And I think we've seen, I mentioned um, the, the, the towns of Phoenix and Talent in Southern Oregon, um, extensive damage due to wildfire, uh, Detroit, uh, other communities, Vida, Blue River, uh, destroyed by the fires. Um, these folks can still vote. Um, they can have a ballot sent to the elections office where they can pick it up there. Where they're staying, they can get the ballot. Or frankly, they can go to their uh, local elections office and vote in person. Because in Oregon, we believe that your vote is your voice and that every single voice matters and that our democracy is stronger when all of us can participate. So here's a practical question. Are there in fact logistical challenges uh, to, to vote by mail that uh, election officials in other states that should, uh, are gonna have to deal with um, uh, it just as a practical matter? Um, and with President Trump uh, you know, raising questions about the legitimacy of, of vote by mail, uh, uh, is that total BS in your view or, or are there uh, in fact things that we should be aware of uh, that presumably manageable problems, but nonetheless actual problems? So I would just say that the president knows nothing about uh, vote it by mail, vote at home. Um, and uh, he's extremely hypocritical on the topic um, because he himself votes yeah. by mail. And I know that members of his cabinet are voting by mail as well. Uh, we have had vote by mail for 30 years. 
I will tell you that our Republican and Democratic secretaries of state, it was actually a Republican secretary of state uh, that promoted the idea. And the goal was literally to put a ballot in the hands of every eligible Oregonian. Um, are there issues? Yes, um, because our president uh, is intentionally undermining uh, the U.S. Postal Service. Right now, more than 50 percent of Oregon uh, voters cast their ballot via a drop box. I, I think a practical issue is, do we have enough drop boxes across the state? Probably not. I'd like to see more. Um, I know that our county clerks are working to make that happen. Um, mostly, um, it is really important way for our rural voters to vote. Um, to vote at home uh, through the mail is very convenient and accessible. So literally, uh, our president is denying or reducing access uh, to many of his, his own voters, which makes no sense whatsoever. Um, the other issues uh, with vote by mail include uh, many states still require a stamp on the ballot. I consider that, I, I consider it similar to a poll tax, certainly not as egregious. Uh, we in Oregon and Washington state as well uh, now automatically uh, uh, provide postage on the ballot. So folks don't have to worry about that. Governor, uh, someone in our audience notes that uh, vote by mail can be made more secure with a digital verification. Is, does that take place in Oregon, do you know? Uh, we, re we have a, a barcode and we verify every single signature. Um, and there's other methodologies, uh, methodologies to ensure the integrity of the vote. We also do audits, essentially recounts, random recounts after every single election. For example, they might pick the president's race in one county, um, a ballot measure race and a local city council and they go through and verify the results. But guess what? Paper ballots are not hackable and you can verify and replicate the results. And given this day and age with the uh, Russian interference in our elections in the 2016 election cycle, and frankly, technology, um, I think paper ballots are uh, honestly uh, verifiable and tried and true. The other thing I would say, the other thing I would say about vote at home, vote by mail, is that with the global pandemic happening, um, Oregonians, Americans don't have to put their lives and their health at risk by going to a polling place. Um, Governor, I'm going to in a moment to turn to business because we're getting a number of questions from people who are uh, themselves uh, business professionals. And uh, I want to turn to that. But before we leave election, um, what is your expectation as a somebody who's a, a, a professional politician and is watching the situation nationally? What are we likely to know on uh, November 3rd? And should we be preparing ourselves not for Election Day, but Election Week or, or possibly even Election Month? Absolutely. Um, we know in Oregon, a vote by mail sometimes takes a couple of days uh, to complete the results. Uh, it's fair to say that at least in an election, that it's more important that the results be accurate than that they be quick and speedy. And I know this from my own experience. Um, as a young uh, 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 candidate, I ran for the House uh, I had a very hotly contested election, and I literally won that race by seven votes. Uh -huh. Seven votes. Close there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm living proof that your vote really does matter, and every voice has to be heard, and um, every ballot needs to be counted. Uh, so the results need to be accurate. So I think the question is. Do we are we willing to wait and ensure the accuracy of the results? And the answer is yes, we must. But I think it's really important for Americans to make a plan to vote. How are you going to vote? Um, if you're going to the polls, do you have adequate time? We know that particularly in Republican states, um, there have been intentional efforts to restrict access to the ballot um, legislation in North Carolina to Texas to Kansas is making it more difficult uh, for people of color, uh, for victims of domestic violence, for seniors, uh, for students to vote. And so I'm encouraging everyone to have a plan. 
And then I'm working with my fellow governors to make sure that we have plans in place uh, to ensure the integrity and security of the election, as well as should there be issues arising uh, following election day. You know, I, you mentioned other governors. That's something I'm curious about uh, because things are so partisan in so many uh, arenas of American life. Uh, do you have uh, relationships and friendships uh, with Republican governors? Absolutely. I have to tell you, one of the joys of being a governor um, is that you can literally uh, work across the aisle. Uh, and my fellow governors have provided support to one another during the pandemic, uh, during these wildfires, um, during the horrific uh, natural disasters that have been happening. As a great example, uh, Roy Cooper in uh, North Carolina and Ron DeSantis in Florida sent teams of firefighters uh, to help us during the wildfires. We typically send teams of firefighters to help them during uh, hurricane season. Uh, so we help each other out. Um, as governors, we have to GSD, uh, get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to be pragmatic and realistic. Uh, I will tell you that Larry Hogan, Governor Hogan of Maryland, was the chair of the National Governors Association, uh, red or blue governor. I think we all reached out to him to get his support, ask for information during the pandemic. Uh, certainly, uh, it's been uh, it's strengthened these uh, relationships. Unfortunately, that's one of the silver linings of this pandemic. Well, we've got a, on business uh, uh, themes. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Robert uh, Kahn, uh, and uh, uh, he said he recalls attending a, a breakfast by the, uh, with the Portland Chamber of Commerce in 1991. He thinks it was uh, okay. Attorney General Bill Barr was the speaker, uh, and uh, he was says he was unimpressed with Attorney General Barr, uh, at least on the first run around. Uh, we don't know. Uh, he didn't he hasn't commented on whether he feels the second tenure is uh, is better or worse. But he was impressed at that time with the uh, public pr par uh, private partnerships in Oregon. Um, and he's curious for an update um, uh, on that. Um, and uh, uh, I might throw in another question that's on a related theme. Somebody's wondering uh, what has the Oregon government done to help small businesses uh, during the uh, during the pandemic? All right. Well, that's two um, uh, questions that I could spend hours talking about. Um, I'll just go to uh, small businesses first because they are truly the heart and soul of Oregon's economy. And um, I think they're part of what makes Oregon's um, uh, culture so unique. Uh, we pride ourselves on our creativity, our innovation, and uh, being, I'll just say this, mavericks. Uh, you talked about our bike-friendly uh, communities. Uh, we pride ourselves on our microbrews and our, I would argue, uh, world-famous Pinot Noirs. Uh, we are also doing really well in the cheese uh, uh, culture as well. Uh, and our uh, environment uh, makes us uh, want to... Uh, um, show off. Uh, we were one of the states that started the farm uh, to table movement through one of our local rec restaurants by the name of Higgins. But all of this lends itself to creativity and in innovation. And we capture that in our small business climate. During the pandemic, uh, we did a number of things, including uh, setting up a hotline uh, so that small businesses could call in and help out. Uh, I worked when I was Secretary of State to create the Small Business Advocate in the Secretary of State's office. Uh, we are uh, collaborating in that work to make sure that our small businesses have the support, the tools, the resources they need to thrive. Uh, we're hoping to expand. Uh, a lot of states do small business shopping on the Friday after Thanksgiving. We're hoping to expand that so that Oregonians uh, will continue to shop at small businesses um, now through the end of the year and support uh, these job creators. So all of the above, uh, we think our small businesses are critically important to our economy, as well as also uh, create jobs, not just in um, cities like Portland, but in smaller communities like Pendleton and Ontario and Klamath Falls. In terms of public-private partnerships, uh, there's absolutely no question that 
Uh, these are what sustain us as a state. Uh, I, I'm so uh, excited to see um, that our nonprofit organizations here in Oregon have really stepped up and are raising money to help the communities that have been devastated by these wildfires to date have raised over $5 million. Our business community uh, from Nike on down have made uh, significant investments uh, to help to support the families devastated by the wildfires. And they are many. Uh, roughly over 4,000 uh, Oregonians have lost their homes. So um, it is only through working together collaboratively, collectively, that we can rebuild a stronger Oregon. And it's going to be a public-private partnership, both the private sector and the nonprofit sector as well, all coming together to help their fellow Oregonians. Governor, we, we've got just a couple minutes left and uh, just a, a couple final questions. Um, uh, uh, one theme uh, of your remarks, it seems to me, if I'm hearing correctly, is that the actual uh, electorate and the actual leaders who are in charge of solving problems, whether Democrat and, or uh, Democratic or Republican, uh, are actually less divided. They're more practical, less ideological uh, than the the uh, picture of, of, of our politics that gets created by the most extreme voices. Um, and uh, if I'm correct in, in, in discerning that theme, uh, there's a question here from uh, Robert Rubenstein. He's the chairman of the TBLI group uh, and wonders whether you might expect more states uh, to move towards ranked choice voting uh, like Maine has in the future. Um, uh, that's one response uh, that, that people have said, say, look, uh, the, the divisions are being exaggerated by the way we vote and, and a more rational way of voting. Uh, might have incentives more toward the center where most people are. Uh, I'm curious what you think of that. So um, I am watching uh, rank choice uh, play out in the state of Maine. Uh, we also have a couple communities here in Oregon uh, that have moved forward with rank choice. And, and my observation is that generally speaking, as it's played out in other countries, uh, what it does is create a more diverse uh, leadership elected leadership. And I think that's critically important uh, that our leadership uh, reflect the diversity of our communities. And we know that when we have a more diverse leadership, the public policies that we develop are more resilient. They're more reflect, uh, reflective of the communities and frankly, more respectful of the communities. So I'm going to be watching uh, Maine uh, with um, great interest. But I would also say that we can't just stop there. I think there needs to be a number of changes in our election system if we really want to engage uh, the American electorate. Um, how we vote, making sure it's accessible and convenient to all eligible Americans. We have a voter registration system that is designed to um, keep uh, many voices out. And that must change. I would look uh, to what we did in Oregon with our opt uh, opt out system of automatic voter registration um, as the model. Um, how we vote, we've talked about vote by mail, uh, voting from home, the convenience and accessibility and the safety. Um, but it, we can't stop there. It also needs to go to how we uh, finance uh, campaigns. Uh, we have a ballot measure uh, to allow for campaign finance reform in Oregon on the ballot in November. Um, but obviously, I believe this country needs to take a look at Citizens United and the ability of um, many, frankly, to pour millions of dark dollars uh, into these campaigns. Redistricting, uh, another issue that we need to examine. I think all of these uh, need to be discussed if we want to have a fully engaged electorate. And frankly, if we want to have elected officials that truly reflect the diversity of our country. Governor, I want to be respectful of your time and the people in the audience's time. So, uh, uh, maybe I could have a question for you to uh, uh, offer some summary thoughts. Um, and it would uh, be this, if I could get you to, to sort of cast your mind forward and, and with what you expect to happen. Uh, listening to you or just reading the news uh, 
uh, on Politico or anywhere else these days. It's very easy to get pessimistic. We've got, uh, we're so divided as a country. We've got such uh, uh, immediate problems uh, 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 relating to race, uh, relating to the, uh, the pandemic and the uh, economic and public health effects that has. And that's saying nothing about the longer term problems like climate change. Um, uh, very, very easy to get pessimistic, uh, but, but invite you to uh, give us some things to be optimistic about. And maybe uh, in that you could also tell us uh, uh, what you expect uh, relating to the, the, the coronavirus. When are we going to be past mm-hmm. this in a way where it's the preoccupying, no longer the preoccupying subject uh, for people in their daily lives? or people like you who have responsibilities for states. Uh, uh, gaze into the crystal ball uh, for uh, uh, for a moment, and, and if you can, uh, and do so honestly, give us something to feel a little better about. Well, I'll, I'll just talk about the pandemic first, and I, I'm a fan of Dr. Fauci. I, I expect uh, that over the next few months, uh, we will start to have access to a vaccine. I think what's most important is that we ensure that this vaccine is accessible to our communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic, and that's our communities of color and our low-income communities. Um, I suspect we're probably on a year trajectory uh, in terms of the pandemic, uh, but um, we are beginning to and, and and learning more about the virus and learning how to deal with it from a medical perspective. And I think that's a good thing. And um, I, I, I think we're learning as we move along. Uh, at the outset, uh, we were not wearing masks. Now, many of us are. The science behind it is very clear. So I'm confident that in addition to vaccines, we will develop other tools and other ways of addressing uh, the pandemic so that we can protect our most vulnerable Oregonians and our most vulnerable Americans. Um, So it's not going to be easy. Um, There are a few silver linings. Uh, As I said, Republican and Democratic governors working together. Um, I think telehealth uh, for our uh, rural Americans uh, has shined uh, throughout this pandemic. And I think that you're going to see other ways of uh, culture change uh, that uh, will help us address it um, as we move forward. In terms of the election, I, I would just say this. Uh, I am living proof uh, that each one of us can make a difference. I mentioned earlier, John, that I won my first race by seven votes. And I will have I will tell you that decades later, I still have people say to me, Governor Brown, I was your seventh vote. I was the reason that you won. Each person believes that they made a difference. And I would say this to every American, vote. Your vote truly does matter and you can make a difference in this election by participating in this very fundamental act of democracy. It is not a spectator sport. We have to engage. And uh, I, I think if we can all do that, um, America will continue to shine and that we will continue to be a leader um, n- for the entire world. All right. Well, great words to close on. Uh, Governor, thank you very much for your time and for uh, uh, such interesting and candid answers. And uh, uh, thanks to everyone in the audience. Uh, I was able to get several questions, a couple that I didn't get, but uh, um, uh, a very energizing conversation. And I hope uh, uh, when we get the green light, I can come visit you in Oregon. We'd love to have uh, have you uh, sample our famous famous Pinot Noir. Okay. I've already done that, including during the pandemic. It would be nice to tour the vineyards in person. Thanks so much, Governor. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Be safe out there.